Good morning. James Smith, Panix Data. So um, I guess uh, I need to start by saying that I, maybe I understood the tech unplugged. Um, I sort of saw it, read it, and I thought, oh, great. It's a, a, an opportunity for us uh, IT people to sort of maybe think about what else we wanted to do when we unplug from the tech and we go and do something else. And you, you can probably tell from my build that I like cakes. Uh, and uh, I eat a lot of them. Uh, but I also bake quite a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of like, Great British Bake Off and all those good things. And uh, I also, I, I just generally like making things. And I've often thought about, you know, a small business. And my name's Smith, so obviously I come from that sort of manufacturing background, I guess. You know, the old blacksmiths and all that sort of thing. Um, and I thought, well, you know, one of the things I'd love to do is start a small business. And a bakery business, I thought, would be fairly straightforward to do. I mean, I've got a kitchen. I've got an oven. Um, you know, how hard can it be? And then you start to think about the logistics. And, um, you know, I, I guess I started to think about, well, how do I go and what do I do about ingredients? And, and I am bad at this. I'll be sitting at home and I think, fancy making a cake. And I'll go to the cupboard and I'm missing the butter. You know, we have, you know, we have to have proactive anti-cholesterol type things. You can't bake a cake with that. So you, I go to the shop and I buy the butter and I come back and then I go, right, what else do I need? I need some eggs. I look in the, uh, right, no eggs, so I go and get my eggs. Now, each of those is a journey that I need to make, and it's introducing latency into my uh, creation of my cake, you know. And then if I build a business and I start selling those cakes, how am I going to take those back to the, you know, the, the, the vendor that's going to sell them for me? Am I going to uh, take them a cake at a time as a cake comes out? Do I take it to the shop? Or, you know, do I think about a more efficient way? So I don't want to take it back every time I, you know, I do a cake. Because that's going to just be a waste of time and resource. Uh, fundamentally, you know, that's what we're about. It's about time and resource and doing things effectively and efficiently um, and, and, and making it uh, better for, for your infrastructure. You know, otherwise, this isn't a picture of my cakes. But, you know, this is what you will end up with if you start trying to keep going backwards and forwards every time you want something. And I guess, you know, my point here, I did sort of realize that I had to give a talk, some sort of tech talk um, at this session was, you know, that why do we ask our, our virtual machines to do this? You know, why do we, when a VM is running, when it's running an application, do we make that application keep shuttling backwards and forwards to the SAN to go and get the data? So virtualization, you know, we've talked about storage, we've talked about you know, containers, and we've talked about all the great things that have happened in technology. Um, and I've been around a long time. It's interesting, the history of people and things like that. Um, I'm 30 years this year. It's 30 years next month since I started loading tapes onto a tape library uh, in a, a, a mainframe data center. Um, the big open reel things that you see in the 1960s movies, I'm sure a few of you have worked on them, the vacuum tubes and having to clean them and then load the tapes. Uh, and I used to operate IBM VM. Uh, so my wife is always saying about fashion and things like that. Nothing is ever new. Well, virtualization isn't really new either. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember virtualization coming along. Um, I first came across VMware when I was an SE uh, at an organization. I needed to run up three different servers. And I didn't have the physical kit, a bit like the home lab. Didn't have the physical kit. And um, I downloaded um, VMware version, I don't know what it was, version one. There was no ESX. It was the original workstation product. Put it on my laptop. And I remember I should have seen the light then when I went into a customer to demo my product. And I spent more time explaining how I was running three instances of Windows on my laptop. At that point, the light should have gone on. It didn't. Um, but you know, what's happened with, with virtualization is that, you know, we know this. This is, this is standard stuff for you guys. It's, it's become hugely successful. We're driving more and more in there. We're putting more and more VMs in there. We can do this very easily. It's easy to deploy more and more virtual first and all those good things. But that's driving you know, a huge amount of density. IO I blending was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, this, this thing that we're driving more and more, more, and more IO through the environment. We have network you know, bandwidth constraints. It's, you know, if we're using shared storage, which makes, you know, allows you to do virtualization so much better, you're now having to transmit data around across the network. And you have some sort of storage array uh, you know, there. 
and it has its constraints. We're talking about flash, putting flash into those, um, which is you know what's what's been happening, and you know some people are getting into dedicated boxes. People are trying to cram it into existing boxes. Um, but actually, it's still fundamentally an array there that is now trying to handle a lot of workload through a set of controllers. And the other thing is that you know, all of this adds a data path. It's like me going to the supermarket every time I need something. Sometimes I'll get in the car and I'll drive there and uh, I don't get up early in the morning, so it's usually mid-afternoon. Um, you know, there's probably not a lot of traffic around. But if I time it wrong, if it's Easter or it's Christmas, I could take hours to get there and it could take me hours to get in and out of the supermarket. So that latency is introduced by the length of data path. And I once got into conversation about the propagation of electrons across the cable. I mean, there are physics involved here as well. It's something like 4.7 nanoseconds per meter. If anybody's interested, apparently I was told, and this guy worked out all the maths around it, and it was, yeah, an interesting beer. Um, but uh, you know, that's, that's the sort of issues that the, the virtualization environment has introduced. And this is uh, Chad Sackek, I'm sure most of you have heard of him. Uh, and he did a great blog it's, I mean, a few years ago now, but you know, he wrote out, drew out this. I could not do this off the top of my head. Um, but you know, when you draw out your stack like this, most people draw virtualization, some storage, and their application, and then the end user on the web or whatever. Um, when you actually draw out the moving parts of our storage I.O., um, it's, there's a lot of moving parts in there. Every piece of that introduces some form of latency. It might be nanoseconds, it might be microseconds, but they all, as in everything in life, accumulate up. Meanwhile, you know, it's been mentioned already, SSD technologies have come along, and there's a huge development in this space right now. It is a hugely exciting area. Um, there's some great things coming along, and Intel announced, you know, in the Chris was talking about um, you know, the technologies in this space, but Intel announced um, chips that they'll be shipping by the end of the year that will allow 10 terabyte SSD drives. Um, they've just introduced their NVRAM, NVMe RAM, um, PCIe flash cards, which now produce, uh, you can buy those at a per gigabyte price, the same as an SSD drive. You can get 800 gigs on a PCIe flash card for about $1,000, um, 1,000 pounds, sorry. Um, so this technology is getting much, much faster. It's also getting much, much cheaper. And yeah, how long before we walk in and there are no more spinning disks? It is all solid state disks, um, solid technologies, holographic uh, memory, etc. So this is a great place and it's rapidly expanding. But you know, how do we make use of this effectively uh, in the environment? Now, I'm going to start focusing down um, and start looking at the, the virtual environment specifically. And you know, one of the things we can do is we have our VM at the top and we have our SAN at the bottom, our shared storage, whatever mode of, uh, or model of technology you want to use in that space. What we could do is if we can split, traditionally performance has been delivered out of the SAN when we look at storage performance, the IOPS. I worked at, uh, I don't know if I should admit this, but I worked at EMC uh, for a, a period of time. Uh, I didn't sell storage. I wasn't part of the storage team. Uh, but I remember doing the, the meetings. I'm sure you've probably all experienced the EMC meetings where they have one person from the customer and 20 people from EMC. And I was part of that set of suits sitting along one side of the table. And I remember the guy would start talking about IOPS and he'd start talking about spindles. And he'd start, you know, and it was like, I'd sit there going, what is he talking about? Surely if they're buying storage, they want capacity. Surely that's what they need. Don't they need capacity? I just had no concept of this whole IOPS and spindles and performance. And that's where still today that storage performance is down on the storage array. But if we can split that in some way, and this is virtualization, gives us the ability to do this. We can start manipulating things in a different way. Now, if we can split that, if we can change the way we travel to the shop, or in fact, stop the journey to the shop, we can actually fundamentally change the performance layer. And this is where that SSD RAM type technology comes into our aid. This is where we can start looking at, well, these are some really, really fast devices now at a very cost-effective price that we can start to use to change the way we do storage I.O. And by doing that up in the hypervisor, 
we can change that journey. We can stop the journey to the shops and start now looking at, well, what have we got in the kitchen and how can we use it in the kitchen? And that's what we want to do. We want to drive down that path, that really shorten the latency. The, lower, the shorter the path, the lower the latency, the faster our applications can run. And once we do that, we can then start moving our storage performance up into the hypervisor layer, and we can start treating it like any other virtual um, resource, just as we now are used to treating RAM and CPU as a resource that we share across a cluster and we can move devices around to where we have capacity, we can do the same with storage and storage performance. But we also can put some intelligence around it, which I noticed was one of the questions earlier. And so if we do this right, and you know, there will be changes, of course. People will move to containers. People will move to different infrastructures. But I'm the, I'm the guy that in 1994, I moved into IT sales. And I'd been doing mainframe operations and had moved into PCs. And I remember doing an interview. And I went for a job at an, a mainframe emulation company. And I remember saying to the guy, but why would I want to take a job here? Mainframes are dead. They're gone. You know, nobody will be buying mainframe emulation anymore because nobody will have any mainframes. Um, and you know, that was the, I'd been in, you know, doing PCs for about five years at that time. And uh, the guy goes, you're an idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about. Sure enough, I joined the company and it continued to grow very rapidly for years and years and years. And companies still main, use mainframes. It is a platform that makes sense for the business that they're used for. So what we have is, you know, infrastructures will change, but companies don't have the ability to do a big bang. You know, there are the Googles of the world and the Facebooks and the Ebays and those who have developed along with the technologies. But a lot of enterprises are still actually using an infrastructure that they've invested in over many, many years. So they won't be able to just make a sudden big change. But what we can do is make subtle changes in the way the infrastructure works that allows them to get far more from it and actually, what uh, we see is a lot of people now make tactical decisions to get over a problem. And if they get that tactical decision right, they can turn it into a strategic way forward, which actually then helps them move forward into other technologies. So if we get this right, not only can we drive down the latency, and not only can we change where we do the storage performance, but we can then, again, add it into the virtual environment in such a way that it becomes a scale-out resource. So now, as we need more, just as we need more CPU, just as we need more RAM in a virtual environment, we add another host where we can do the same with the storage performance. But what we want to do is retain the investment in the existing storage below because it does some great things. You know, say I worked at EMC, so I you know, was indoctrinated with all the, the technologies, but you know, data protection, replication, their five nines availability, you know, these are key things. They're very hard to replicate with white box goods. They're the sorts of things that that's why you pay the money for these things. Now, part of the technology to make this work and to make this happen is uh, you need to change the way the VM is going to talk to the underlying storage. Now, people have done, uh, and, and, and you know, it's very common, um, is sort of recaching. Even VMware you know, has a, an attempt at it in, their, in, in, in the VMware platform where it's very easy to start moving data up closer to the um, CPU. And that's where we want it. We want data locality. We want it up close to where it's going to be used. And for read, that's actually, you know, I'm going to say fairly simple to do. I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to do it. Um, so it's probably uh, a bit naughty of me to say it's fairly simple to do. There's some very clever people who have developed that type of technology. But technically, you know, you're not risking anything by having copies of your data that you're using on a regular basis in an SSD drive up in your host. Okay, if that SSD drive fails, we talked about you know, how long they last, what's the life cycle of the device, that sort of thing. Um, they're, they're, they're good now, they're five, as you say, they're sort of five years um, reliability, um, but there's still a lot of moving parts in a host, and if we lose a host, um, you know, what happens to that data? Well, read only, it's gone, but it's actually still in my sand, it's there, it's good. Just, just to add one bit. Yeah. <clears throat> typically, when they fail, from what, what people say, they fail hard. There's typically not the same failure rate as HDD, where you might get a few errors. It's all or nothing, and I think that's quite an important factor. Yeah. Yeah. Although, actually, it's because they either fail hard because the controller fails, or actually they slow down over a period of time. 
Uh, I know I've got a laptop that's been running an SSD drive for now, I know it's a different space, but a laptop for four years was running Windows, and it's been running for four years, and you know, it's interesting, I powered it up the other day, and it's like, really slow. I've changed the SSD, and bang, it's back again. So it's just a, a degradation. But yeah, you're right. And, and so if, if we do that, reads actually isn't a problem. However, to really fundamentally make use of this type of decoupling of our storage performance from the storage capacity, we have to be handling writes as well. Okay? If I'm going back to my analogy, every time I bake a cake, I stop everything, get in the car, drive to the shop, drop it off and drive back again, I'm not going to get very far. I'm going to be burning cakes in my oven. I'm going to be, you know, the, the, the resources that I'm using to do my baking are going to be sitting still doing nothing. So what we can do is if we do right, we, if we do it correctly, we can, like, again, start fundamentally changing the way we do the whole process of working with the storage for the VMs that are running. And this is the key bit. And this is what, um, you know, Pernick said, getting onto a product and the company um, ha have done and developed. What they've developed is a way, and for me this is the key thing, is a way of taking rights. We're now in the primary data path. That VM has written a block of data, and we've told it we've got it. We've got that block of data. You're safe. You carry on. Now, that's what the person has invested their $2.5 million in their storage array to protect. And now I've put it on a $500 SSD. Okay? Well, how do I protect that? Well, what we do and what the technology does is it actually then writes that across multiple nodes in our cluster. It writes it onto multiple hosts. It writes it onto multiple devices across our cluster. In that way, we can make it truly fault tolerant because if any single node goes down, we can recover it. If the whole environment goes down, if we're putting it onto SSD, then it's still there. When the, the environment boots up again, um, you know, the, 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 they're a non-volatile uh, device, so we, can, um, we have the block sitting there ready to write back down to the storage. But this is the key component. And as soon as we start doing our writes to that level, we're now down in the millisecond latency. If we do it to SSD, I expect millisecond latency. If we do it in RAM, I'm starting to look at sub-millisecond. Um, I did a, a, a POC the other day where VDI environment were running at 0 0.09 millisecond latency on the um, reads and writes. But if it's slow, if that link is slow, then you may as well write to the SAN. And you know, I often have this conversation with customers on explaining the technology is that it's this optimized link that's actually the key to the performance. And then we destage those writes to the back end storage. Those writes get down to the back end storage. Finally, that's where they are going to reside because that's what the customer is invested in. But this also gives us the ability to scale out. Once we start changing the way we use that storage capability and that storage performance, we can start scaling it out. So again, traditionally, you know, sizing of an array, you get a sizing and you try and plan for a period of time that it's going to be available for. Because virtualization is throwing that all out the window because oh, you've got that great virtualization environment. You can, can you deploy me another couple of servers? I've, I've, you know, marketing want to deploy another website. Can we, can we spin that up now? So we have this demand now on the infrastructure. And with Pernix data, what this allows you to do is as you add more compute resource, you can tie in with more um, storage resource as well. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, an SSD drive, an enterprise class SSD drive, um, will typically deliver about 50,000 IOPS when driven hard in this type of environment. That's per host. So now we can be looking at across four hosts, 200,000 IOPS. So instead of diluting as we add hosts, we actually increase our storage capability uh, in the environment. But what this also does is not only are we doing with this SSD, but this also introduces the ability to use RAM. With our fault tolerance, with the ability to write those blocks across multiple hosts, multiple blade enclosures, multiple data centers, if you have low latency links between them, suddenly it opens up the idea of using RAM and RAM is becoming an area of interest for very, very high performance compute. And there are things like you know, specific applications, you know, Gemfire, et cetera, where you've got memory caching libraries. But you're going to have to rewrite. And again, this will happen. People will do this, and the more advanced organization will do it. But generally, most people won't have the capacity, capability to do this anytime soon. 
there are more in-memory applications coming along. I think uh, you know, SAP HANA is probably the most famous. Uh, from my point of view, it's what I get asked about the most. And you know, Oracle 12C, so we have the capability, again, of moving database-type things into RAM. The reason they're doing this is because it adds great performance. But you know, the software vendor has to provide that. So you know, it, it, it needs um, you, know, you to change your application, upgrade to the latest version. There was discussion around upgrading to Oracle, for example, the latest version. You know, do you want to do that? Well, what we can offer is actually running any application you like in RAM. So I can take your SQL Server environment, I can take your VDI environment, and I can start delivering that out of RAM for you. I can give you RAM-level I.O. performance whilst retaining all your investment in your underlying storage. And this is where um, we introduced this um, about six months ago, and um, this has been uh, hugely successful. Um, and a lot of customers are looking at this as a technology of a way of driving their application performance. We have uh, one customer, a reference customer, who has actually taken an Oracle environment from a physical box on customer premise, put it into their cloud infrastructure, and it's now 40% faster because they're delivering it out of RAM. Um, so 40% faster to the end user desktop um, over the, the net. So that's what Pernix Data allows you to do. So what we're looking to do is as technologies develop and as Flash grows, what we're allowing you to do is opposed to just sort of doing a flat, yeah, it's getting faster, we'll put some RAM in the, you know, we'll put some um, SSDs in your storage controller, it was we're allowing you actually to take that up to the application level and start using these hyper-fast technologies in an application-aware way, allow you to actually target this per VM. We were talking, you know, you were asking about, you know, um, understanding the I.O. Well, I can do this at a per VM level. I can say that VM gets RAM performance at that, you know, and it, you know, I'm happy to talk to you about the product. Um, it is that simple. We're non-disruptive, so this is it, the last slide, one minute. Um, so this is the, um, the technology. We require no changes to the VM. There's nothing. No drivers, uh, no application changes, no redirection of a data store. It sits, it thinks it's talking to the NetApp array, the EMC array. Likewise, the storage doesn't know we're there. It sits there and it uh, carries on acknowledging and de delivering I.O. to a VM. So that's the sort of thing we do. We just sit into the environment, very little change, but massive impact implications to the way you do um, the deployment of your storage I.O. and allow you to think about strategically what's my next step in my storage space. And some of the things that our customers are seeing Massive improvements in um, I.O., re huge reductions in latency, and most importantly, reduction in costs. And final slide. This is it. Honest Enrico. Honest Enrico. En honest. Honest. Last slide. I know that I'm standing between these guys and coffee. So uh, this is very much the last slide. This is some testing one of our customers did with, um, uh, I think it's a VMAX at the back end. And it's probably a bit hard to see there. But I just like this because uh, Frank Deniman, some of you may have heard of Frank. This is one of his slides. Uh, he decided that this was a giant mountain, mountain of awesomeness. And uh, this is a molehill of mediocrity. That's a 50,000 IOP uh, molehill of mediocrity. That's 1.6 million IOPs. And that was a maxed out VMAX. They flooded the controllers and got them absolutely maxed out and then delivered 1.6 million IOPs on top of it. So that's Pernix data, that's the effect of Pernix data.